So I've been putting this off for a long time. I bought this grammar from the author at the Greek and Hebrew for Life conference last year. My intention was to review it, but I'm not going to do that. Why? Well, I've been reviewing Greek grammars for quite some time. I started a few years ago, 2019, 2018, somewhere around there, just reviewing Greek grammars. And part of the reason for that was my own curiosity. I wanted to understand how different teachers of Greek were teaching it. Uh, I wanted to understand the different uh, approaches to uh, pedagogy and how they would structure their materials. Uh, I wanted to ex explore the different views of Greek and how that worked. And then I wanted to be able to present to you something that was useful, something that you could use with regards to Greek grammars. And along the way, we've looked at some really old grammars. We looked at Machen's grammar and we've looked at newer grammars. We looked at grammars right after they came out. So it's been a really interesting journey, but it's time to say goodbye to the review of Greek grammars. So why no longer review grammars? Well, there's a number of reasons, but here's the main one. What I've discovered about Greek grammars is that they're written by people for a specific context and they're written for a particular sort of set of outcomes that are often unique to that particular author in that particular context. And this really hit home to me when I was talking to a friend of mine who teaches beginning Greek at a seminary, college seminary, uh, recently, and he was telling me about the Greek grammar he chose to use, which is a minimal grammar. And I was curious, why would you choose a minimal grammar? And his answer was, well, I want to be able to teach it. I want something that's going to give the least information to students so I can give them the most in my lectures. Now, that's that's up to him. He's, you know, he's a good lecturer, he's a good teacher, and he'll do a great job with that. But it really hit home to me that there's so much personal preference in the designing of grammars. And then the context is really going to be a key thing. So those two things, the individual professor or teacher teaching and the context in which they're teaching. And then the next thing from that to discover from that is even if you take all the different personalities and experiences and all their knowledge of Greek and you put it all into, you know, the, what you're putting it into essentially is the same context because one professor who writes a Greek grammar is going to write that Greek grammar for pretty much the same context as anyone else. And the reason for that is that just about every grammar that's being written today is being written for a college or seminary environment, which means that they have got both a carrot, like the people coming along to the course, they're there because they want to learn Greek typically. Uh, in some cases, they have a stick, right? So you have a carrot and you, of the desire and you have the stick of the grades and the semesters and all those kinds of things pushing you along to make sure that you are heralded through and pushed through the course in a timely kind of manner, which means then that it really doesn't matter how you structure the grammar in one sense, because at the end of the day, you still got those constraints and it's not going to be any different for you and me as the average sort of consumer of a grammar who's not in a college and seminary, who just wants to learn Greek. In other words, every grammar that's out there today pretty much is written in largely the same way because they're written for largely the same environment by the same people who are largely writing out of their own experience and within their own context. Now, the only real difference then is going to be the individual authors. Now, I perhaps overstated things just a little bit here because one of the things that drives people to write a grammar could be a change in those scenarios. For instance, I know that some grammars are written for a one semester Greek course. Other grammars, such as Bohr, is written for a five-week Greek course. And then there are others that are written for, like Mounce's Basics of Biblical Greek, a two-semester Greek course. So there are some differences in terms of the constraints around the length of time often given for beginning Greek, but really it's minor, and at the end of the day, you've still got the carrot and the stick, and you're still being driven along. And also, you know, you've still got the same kind of environment this material is going to be delivered in. It's going to be delivered in a classroom environment, so that students can sort of sit there, listen, and then ask questions of the professor. Now, when it comes to self-study, when it comes to studying Greek on your own, these are okay if you're going to try and do that, but ultimately I think you want to ask the question, is this really designed for my context? And if it's not, then you probably want to look for something that is a little bit more designed for your context. One other difference we do tend to find between these grammars is that there is some variation in the knowledge and understanding of how the Greek language works. We have questions such as, is Greek primarily temporal or do we have uh, an aspectual language? And if so, where on the spectrum does that live? And we've seen some grammars such as 
Con Campbells and Dana Harris's who have argued that it's completely uh, completely aspectual and there's no time in the indicative mood whatsoever. And they've got others that really still do hold on to time in the indicative mood. But th this is, these are just matters of, you know, discussion that are still going on amongst scholars. Uh, we also have differences in terms of the place of linguistics. Some uh, professors will put, give more credence to linguistics than other grammars will. Uh, some, some professors will say, well, grammar is just grammar. It's been taught like this and I'm just customizing it for me and I don't really care much about linguistics. And that's totally fine as well. I think there's a role for linguistics, but that's okay. You don't have to agree with me, nor do you have to go and know all of that to be able to write your own grammar. Uh, then there's pedagogical order. What order do you write things in? And this is probably one of those areas that I think is really interesting because many of the grammars are organized thematically. That is that they will start with nouns, then they'll go with verbs. Uh, they might mix it up a little bit. You've got nouns and verbs and so on. But what you typically find with all of these grammars is that it's very easy for those who are going through the grammar and learning with it to become kind of overwhelmed. And of course, because this is designed for a seminary environment, the answer to that is just, well, get over it. There's nothing we can do about that. But if you're looking at this from the point of view, you don't have that stick, you've only got the carrot, and you know, you're working with one of these beginning Greek grammars, and it's starting to get overwhelming and you've got no hope of sort of completing this and understanding it, well, that's going to just erode your motivation and you're not going to be very, it's not going to be easy for you to complete and your desire is going to be destroyed by the overwhelming complexity of using one of these grammars. And so, and then of course there's issues like pronunciation and so on. So realistically, what we're looking at is we're looking at a, a group of grammars that are designed for seminary and college environments that are great for that context and for that end, but they aren't that, they're not really that good for uh, learning Greek on your own. And that's not to say people can't do it, people have done it and people will continue to do it. But I'm just saying that if I'm going to review these, these are the constraints that we've got to deal with. And then you've got to ask the question, well, is it really worth it? Is there really enough difference from one grammar to another to warrant taking the time to actually review it and say, well, this is good or this is bad or this is different because, you know, they have a temporal view of the language or because they, they take a little bit more stock of linguistics. I mean, is that really the sort of thing you need from me on these YouTube videos? So I'm no longer going to review grammars. Instead, what I'm going to do is if something really interesting comes my way or someone raises something to say, hey, this is a completely new approach to learning Greek, I'll look at it. I'm really interested in that. And I might even do a video on it. So I'm not saying I'm not going to do it, nor am I saying that these aren't good grammars. They are great grammars. And that this is not really a critique of those grammars. It's really just to say that they all kind of fit the same space and they're all doing things in a very consistent kind of way. My personal goal and my desire for you is that you learn Biblical Greek, that you don't have some of these constraints, but that you learn it because you desire to learn it, not because you have to learn it. My goal really, and what we're trying to do in Biblical Mastery Academy, if we go back to the 1400s and we look at John Wycliffe, John Wycliffe wanted to translate the Bible from Latin into English. And he wanted to do that because at that stage, the only people who read the Bible at all were pastors and scholars. My personal goal is to do the same thing with Greek. I want the, the idea of learning to read and, and study the language and study Greek, study the New Testament and the Old Testament and the original languages. This should no longer be something that only pastors and only scholars do. This is something that the average person can do. And that's why I'm creating my own Greek grammar, which I've talked about before. You can find a link to the videos about that just, just up here. But that's why I'm creating my own Greek grammar. For the average person who really just wants to be able to read the Greek on their own, they don't have the stick, they only have the carrot, the desire to learn Greek, the desire to know the Word of God better. That's kind of what I'm trying to achieve here in Biblical Mastery Academy. So if you're interested in doing that, joining me with that, then you can get started right now. Go to bma.to slash get started. Uh, jump into our free get started course, which is just going to give you an overview of what's involved in learning Biblical Greek. It'll introduce you a little bit to our Beginning Greek in Small Steps course and give you an overview of how we help you through our membership. You know, it's all totally free. You don't have to pay anything for that. Just go to bma.to slash get started and jump in. We'd love to be able to serve you there. In the meantime, if you do come across something that helps you teach, learn Greek really, really well, a, a really outstanding Greek grammar, I would love to hear from you, but I'm probably not going to go review it unless it really is a standout grammar. All right, so that's it from me. Let me know what you think in the comments below. I'd love to hear your thoughts on beginning Greek grammars as well. 
Otherwise, this is me signing out of reviewing Greek grammars, and I'm kind of happy about that. Look forward to hearing from you in the comments below and seeing you in the next video. I'll see you there.